I just wanted to show everyone uh, how we can map shallow water environments in the coastal zone. Uh, and I'm aware that there's a variety of technical people here, so GIS uh, or remote sensing analysts or just policy makers. And the point of this workshop is just to show you a relatively simple way to be able to do this um, pretty much on wh wherever, wherever you are in the world and whatever laptop you have as well. So before we begin, I just want to tell you a bit about um, where I've come from in this project. So uh, with CME, I've previously done a lot of work to do with the uh, mapping of Tenef Atoll. And so that was the main uh, topic of my master's project. And so there I led the hab habitat mapping using satellites. And then from that work, I moved on to map the entire of Bluesin's shelf. And that work is due to come out later this year. And some of you may also know of the projects uh, that we're also doing out in the Caribbean to do with shoreline change mapping in EO, EO Foresty. So uh, I myself have been doing that for NOC. So you may also have seen this data as well. And um, so if you're interested in shoreline change and a lot in a lot of areas around the world, we've just got a map here of showing our main locations, then just head over to the data portal and um, you can see what we've been producing there. Anyway, so what we're going to do today, so we're just going to discuss what is Google Earth Engine and we're going to explore the code editor platform that they use. Now this is slightly different to a lot of uh, main GIS uh, software like ArcMap or QGIS and it's a little bit more technical and uses uh, scripting. Now don't be daunted by that. I'm very new to uh, coding and, and scripting. So this is, I've made it more of a simple to understand uh, view that you can do online. So we're just gonna go through a simple classification to do with cloud and land masking, similar to what Tim just went through uh, and a medium composite. We're gonna to touch on satellite derived bathymetry because this is gonna be one of the inputs to the classification. We're going to build some training data and then we're going to actually carry out the classification and serial accuracy assessment. So the main thing here is just to show you really how we, how we can do these things and to give you just a baseline understanding. And after this presentation, uh, hopefully in the next week or two, I will uh, share with you the instruction manual, which goes through a, a really detailed step by step guide. Uh, so those of you who are more technical can just work through it in your own time. So this, yeah, this talk is going to be about 55 minutes and there's a Q&A if uh, anyone has any questions after this. And then hopefully we, you can um, finish a bit earlier um, as this session isn't going on as, as long as the other ones. So yes, what is Google Earth Engine? Well, this is quite a, a new and I think revolutionary part of satellite data analysis and this is based on a cloud-based geospatial processing platform. Now what does that mean? Well uh, a lot of the time when you are using satellite data you often have to download all the data on your laptop and do your analysis on there and if you don't have a good laptop it could be quite painful you could, could be sitting there for quite a while processing this, this data well, Google Earth Engine um, kind of skips all of that pain uh, by having the ability to use Google's own servers. So they've got obviously top of the range servers where you can just process large amounts of data that are all held online. And then they have some really nice tools where if you're working on satellite data with other people, you can then share your work routines online as well. And you'll, you'll see that when we go through that soon. So today we're looking just at Sentinel-2 data, which is one of the most common optical satellites that people use to monitor the Earth. And on Google Earth, they have uh, surface reflectance data, which is the one we're using today. And that's corrected for the atmosphere and the clouds. So, just because I want to 
in, like have a more interactiveness in this presentation, I encourage you to visit the first link that I sent you in the chat, which is called Explore Sentinel 2 Images. So if you just open that up, and Tim, can you can you now see this Chrome window? Or not? Uh, no, I'm afraid not at the moment. Okay, I'm just gonna have to stop the share and reshare this. Right. So uh, yeah. If you follow this link, I'll, I'll just talk you through exactly what I'm seeing on the screen. So for those of you who don't have the, um, if you haven't signed up to Google Earth Engine, then uh, don't worry, you can just watch me. So here we're just, we've just got a map of the US and we're just going to explore some Sentinel-2 data. So on the bottom left here, we've got a uh, select a point on the map. So I encourage you to just zoom into wherever you want in the world, wherever you're interested in, wherever you're living in. And in this case, I'm just gonna do Belize because that's where uh, my example is. So I'm just gonna click to place a point and I've just clicked uh, on the map where I'm interested in. And I'm just gonna select a target date and you can choose whatever you like. I'm just gonna go with uh, one that's already here, March the 17th. And then point three, uh, I'm just gonna select an interval of six months and then a standard cloud uh, cover, maximum cloud cover of 60. And then if you click on browse images, there's a panel on the right, which uh, you can enlarge by um, scrolling your cursor in the middle of the screen. And so this is all the satellite data that's at this point, uh, or at your point, if you've picked a different place on the earth, um, around the target date. So as you can see, we've, this is quite a, a handy tool to just scan through lots of data um, in a short space of time. And so uh, you'll notice that there's, there's quite a few images here that are a bit cloudy. This one particularly uh, is quite good. So if we want to have a, look, a further, more detailed look, we can then add this to map and just zoom in and have a little explore. So it's, it's, quite, it's quite a handy tool if you just want to uh, just visualize some satellite data of your area. So I'm going to bring this back to the PowerPoint now. And if you just come back to this PowerPoint with me as well. And then we'll, we'll take you to the next stage. So I'll just present view again, I'm afraid. Sorry? We're back on present view. Okay, right, let's just try this. All right, there you go. Yep. Is that Good. right? Yeah, that's grand. Lovely. Uh, yeah, so hopefully you're all back with me now. And so obviously, as we noticed, there was quite a few images in there with lots of cloud. And this it can be a real pain if you're just trying to use some satellite data within a certain time period. And so to create some usable satellite data that we can map, uh, we can go through a stream like this where we gather the archive. We might instantly remove these two images because they've got loads of cloud in them. And then we mask the existing cloud in all the images that are available and then merge them all together through a median composite, which I'll discuss with you in a second. And so this, this example on the right is just a median composite of data from 2020 um, over the Belizean shelf. So I touched on it there about creating a median composite. Now, what does that mean? So on the left here, I've got five satellite images that I had, and I'm just picking out one single pixel in that. So this is just a 10 by 10 meter pixel. And the, the values in the middle here are the values that represent the brightness of a single pixel and a single band uh, for each of these. So for image one here, we've got a value of 261, two a value of 267 and so on. And you'll notice that uh, image five has a really high pixel value. 
and this represents the brighter areas which are the cloud and so when we take a median composite we effectively put all these values for a single pixel in order and then we take the middle value so in this case it'll be 261. Now obviously if it, another way of merging this data together would be take a, to take a mean but if we were to do that we'd end up with a value of 2421 which is, is not what we want. We want the bottom cover or benthic habitat cover um, which is around 250 here. So a mean is just not appropriate. So if I bring you to an, another example and we change our pixel to somewhere else in the map, uh, you'll see in the middle column, we've got a different mixture of pixel numbers. So we've got three values here for one, images one, two, and five. And they're all showing values of about 3,800. So when we come to take the median on the right, when we put them in order, we're going to uh, extract a value of 3,798, which is obviously not what we want because that is cloud. So how do we combat this? Well, we're going to have to mask out these areas of cloud and get rid of these high values. So we'll just end up with 254 and 213 and we can use that data in the final composite. So how do we create the mask? Well, when you download any satellite data or um, what comes with the satellite data is just a very basic cloud mask. And this is shown on the left here. So these are zones of blue are where uh, ESA, when they produce the Sentinel-2 data, uh, they give you this cloud mask, which as you can see, it's, it's not appropriate. There's large amounts of cloud here, which isn't masked out. So recently they've developed a cloud probability layer, which they provide alongside the imagery as well. So in this case, we've got a, a short video on the right here, which shows the cloud, cloud probability layer. And we just use a threshold to say, oh, anything above a certain value, that is cloud. And so if we apply this to all of the images in uh, our analysis that we're going through, we can then provide a much more effective and smoother median composite. So we're looking at shallow water environments. So similar to what Tim was going through earlier, we're going to need to develop a land mask as well. Now, I'm just using the near infrared band. So this is just the, the, the band on the left here. And this is what it looks like. So those darker areas are the water. And that's where the um, radiation from the satellite, from the sun, sorry, is being absorbed and none is being reflected back to the satellite. And that's why it's looking a lot darker. So when you compare that to land and you put a histogram together, you can see that there's a lots of water pixels which have got a very low reflectance. So we can quite easily just say, this is land on the right and this is, this is water on the left. And that's gonna be our threshold. So we can just do our analysis of the shallow water environments. So how do we actually go about uh, analyzing the satellite data and producing these, these products to then make a classification at the end? Well, this is where Google Earth Engine really comes into its own. So this is what it looks like. So it should just be the same in any Internet Explorer. And you've got four main windows. So the window on the top left, it's similar to your file explorer on just your computer. And you have a series of files, which are the scripts that I've, I've built in this case. So we're going to go through in a minute. And also your assets, which are 
your data sets or maps at the end of it. You then have a central window, which is your scripts, and that's where you run a lot of your tools. And then on the right, we have a console where you will have, you'll print your outputs and some tasks where you will export data to your computer. At the bottom here, that's where you can visualize your outputs and just have a have a play with your data to see to see what's going on. So to make it easier, I've created a series of scripts that all look fairly similar. So this is an example here of the create land mask. And we have uh, at, right at the top of the scripts, we've got these imports and they can be your own data or data that we correct uh, create in the map view. And for each script, you'll have a couple of requirements and they are the imports needed. So as you can see here, for this landmark script to run, we've got two requirements, one of which is a point of interest around the world. And the second is just a boundary for you to uh, look at in that area. And so the second uh, half of this script window is your parameters. So the green commented out section is all the parameters that we're we're going to need. So uh, when are we looking at the start and end date? The uh, cloud maximum cloud product product probability. Sorry, and that's the threshold that I was talking to you about earlier, and some sort of uh, near infrared threshold, and some output files. So now with, I've shown you that, if you've signed up to this, um, you can follow me and this is the second link in the chat box. So I'm just gonna stop sharing and reshare my browser. And this will open up the same window that you'll have if you follow the link. So it should look similar to this. I'll just give you a few seconds if you are following along. Also, if anyone has any questions about um, what I'm doing or if I haven't explained something well, then feel free to put something in the, in the chat box and I'll try and answer those where I can. So for those of you who have opened up this window, uh, you'll see exactly the same uh, format that we just went through a minute ago. And on the left here, there's a users and it should be your username and the mapping workshop that we're going through today. So I'd like you to click on Visualize Sentinel 2 and just click in the scripts window in the middle, you'll see the button run. So just click that. Now, at the minute, we haven't def defined a point of interest. So just like we did before, zoom into anywhere in the world. In this case, I'll head back to Belize. And in the map view window, on the left, you'll see a point marker tool. And just click on that. And again, click on a point in the map, wherever you're interested in. And then it, you'll see in the scripts window, you'll see an import. And this in this case, it says geometry. But we want to rename that to POI or point of interest. And then, so this is the only requirement for this script to run. And then we need a, a few parameters that I've already put in there. So we're just looking at some satellite data, data from 2020. And we're using a cloud threshold um, of 40%. So any images in the collection which are above 40% cloud won't be included. We then run this and you'll see in a minute the image that we've created. So as you can see, we've got a fairly nice satellite image here. And if you're in a, a, a cloudy area of the world, you might see some cloud artifacts still in the image. So this is why 
we need the masking process that I mentioned. So if you then make this, um, if you go to your file explorer style window on in the top left, you will see Sentinel-2 difference. So if you click on that, we'll abandon our changes for now. And again, we're gonna to need to put our point of interest in. So if you just head to the map view, and then I'm gonna point at Belize again, and then rename this POI, and then run the tool again. So this one takes a bit longer, but you'll see that on the left, we've got a central image that we had before, and this doesn't have any mask uh, applied to all the images. And in a minute, you'll see an image on the right, which is where we have masked every image in the collection and then done this median composite. So this central slider, you could then use to see the difference between the two. Now, whilst this is still loading, you can see that obviously the left side is uh, still got clouds in it. Um, you can still see these little artifacts which make the difference between features on the ground not as uh, variable. Now, if I slide this across, you will see the difference between the two. So in the one on the right, you will start to see more clearly labelled uh, features on the ground. So in this case, we can see seagrass in a bit more detail. So this is the product that we want to work with now. So uh, if, you've, if you have been working through this, now we'll come back to the, the Zoom call and I'll explain the next few scripts because they need a few more inputs and it's a bit more complicated. So we've got a couple more scripts on the left-hand side and two of these are bathymetry. Now these are just similar uh, methods to what Tim described earlier and one of which is the stump method that Tim went over and the other is a Lysenger 1985. Now both of these require some bathymetry data and uh, this is uh, just some bathymetry points that I uh, we've collected from the LiDAR data. Now, once you've uploaded your bathymetry points, uh, you can then run the tool and it will give you a couple of bands to export and they'll be exported to your assets, which is over here. So I've done this previously and here we've got the uh, bathymetry layers here. So we can have a quick look at that as well. I just make this a little bit bigger. So in the map view, we've got some bathymetry data. It's not very well um, picked out here, but we can just stretch this data, maybe a bit more. And you can start to see some features. And this is the same area that Tim was working through before. So this is one of the main inputs that goes to our next stage, which is creating the training data. Now in this uh, scripts, this requires the land mask layer as well, but I'm not gonna go over that because it's all covered in the instruction manual. So. Um, feel free to go into more detail uh, in that afterwards in your own time. So this is just creating, creating some training data for the classification. Now, as you can see, there's a lot going on here, but some of it's just repeated uh, because we're just collecting some data for each class. So again, we've got a point of interest, our bathymetry that we just calculated, uh, some high resolution data that I've loaded in, but you might have some drone data that you can also put in there as well. And then we've got our four main classes that I'm going through today. So that's seagrass, sand, coral, and deep water. Now, if I just pull this up so we can see the map view, I'm just gonna run this tool. And you can see that I've created, just taking a few 
if I can still load. So I've created some polygons, which we, uh, as James mentioned in the talk on Friday, uh, this is a method called expert labeling. Now, it's uh, advised that you do this with a mixture of high resolution imagery and ground truth data. So you might have a series of points or photos that you've taken on the ground. Like if we just had a, a drone survey of this small island. Uh, yeah, you might also have some, some points here that you can load in and you can look at to discriminate what's what. So in this example, I am just going to uh, add another polygon to our, class, uh, our training data. And we're just going to look at sand. So I can quite easily see if I, draw, if I click this polygon tool, I can see this area is, is sand. And I'm quite confident that we can use this to build our training data for the classification. So this is just as simple as adding, adding the polygon. And there it is. So you might do this all around the, the, the study area that you're looking at. And it's quite, um, it's advised that you get quite a lot of areas because uh, it's important to reduce the amount of spatial autocorrelation that James highlighted in the talk on Friday. And this is where you want lots of different polygons around the image. Uh, to increase the reliability of your classification. So once you've drawn all of, all of your polygons, you then uh, press the tool, uh, the run in the, the run script tool, and this will extract a series of random points from all these polygons, and then it uh, tasks in the top right will show you a couple of uh, data sets, your training and validation data that you're going to use for the classification. So once you run these, uh, they will be exported to your assets. So this is like obviously your, your file explorer style window and they'll appear here. So as you can see, we've got uh, some CME workshop training and validation data. And this brings up me on to the, the final stage of the process, which is the classification. Let's abandon those changes. So this script is probably the one that takes the longest. So I'm going to uh, bring you back to my presentation shortly. But again, this requires a point of interest, your landmarks, the training, validation, the bathymetry layers that we mentioned. And again, some, some parameters that are similar to the ones we mentioned before. So when you run the tool, you'll come to a classification which will look like this. Just bring you back to the presentation that we back in should be presented to you now. Can we see that, Tim? Yeah, that's grand. That's grand. Lovely. So this is the training and validation data that we've used for each of the uh, zones. And this is the area that we were just looking at. So the red points here are your training data and the blue, your validation data. So it's important to say just for simplicity, I've just taken all of the data from the same source, but Ideally, you'd want to go out and pick some validation points, uh, either from a completely separate polygon data set or just individual photos that you've, um, you've taken that can then be used to assess the accuracy. But as I said, here we're just, we're just looking at the points in blue to validate the data. So this is the data that we've been working with. And this is the classification that comes out, out about five minutes later than um, uh, when I run the tool. So if I just flick between the two, you can see 
a pretty good uh, idea about uh, what's what, uh, especially, uh, I mean, the coral reef areas, you can see that are north of Belize City. Uh, there's, there's some turbid water there, so it's actually picking up some coral which doesn't exist. Um, and that's because these turbid waters are reflecting a similar signature to uh, actual coral reef areas that you can see on the, the top right of the map um, where there is the reef. So when you come to use these maps, it's really important to discuss what are the limitations, including even when you have accuracy statistics like these in the top right. Now, I'm just gonna bring these to the, the next window and make this a bit bigger for you. But this map is saying an overall accuracy of 0.9 or 90%. Now, as, as we mentioned, there's a fair amount of the area that's north of Belize City, which really isn't looking like uh, what it actually is in the ground. And that's because we've taken our, uh, we've built our ground truth data set from these vectors, these polygons of really high confidence areas. So as I showed you, we, we built, built a polygon of sand where it was quite obvious that there was going to be sand there. And so that can give some misleading results in the accuracy assessment. So the way to get around that is obviously flag these, these limitations. And also, if you're going out to do some surveys and maybe you've got a drone survey, it's important to go out to places where you're, you're maybe not so confident about what's on the, um, on the seabed. And then you can incorporate this in your, your ground truth data set. And then the accuracy should be more representative, representative of uh, what's the true. So uh, another common way to assess how well your map has been produced is through a class confusion matrix. And this is just comparing what you can actually see. Uh, so that's your validation data versus what the map is producing. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that, but uh, as I said before, we've got this, this instruction manual that's gonna come out uh, very soon. So if you're interested in that, then, then definitely follow that. So that's it for me. I'll, I'll hope, hopefully you've, you've learned a bit about how to use these tools. And um, if not, yeah, go, go ahead and use this instruction manual, work through what, what you've done. And if you've got some existing data or bathymetry data, you can just edit those tools online that I've been through today and yeah, apply it to your own area and hopefully uh, you can get some nice results. And so if you've, if you've made some, some good maps and are confident with them, I'd love to hear it from you. So uh, yeah, please, please send me an email or send one to the, the CME team and uh, we can keep in touch. So thank you.